Hi, Mohamed. Thank you so much for coming to the Investor Talk. How are you? Very good. And you? Oh, good. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks so much for your time and all the good uh, topics we'll be covering for our founders and tips, of course. So if you want to give an introduction to yourself before we start our talk. Yeah, so I, uh, my name is Mohammed Jamal. <clears throat> I was um, actually, uh, I spent the first half of my uh, life in Morocco where I was a student until uh, uh, preparatory classes. I moved to France to study uh, maths and engineering. Uh, then I uh, decided to, uh, when I finished my studies in Paris, I moved to uh, the UK to work for Morgan Stanley. I worked for Goldman and then I began for Morgan Stanley in the capital market side. Then in 2009, I moved to a fund, a, a US-based credit fund that was running their business in Europe. And in 2012, I decided to leave and uh, set up my own firm. So I set up a trading business called the uh, Moulton Street Capital, um, and then um, I became an entrepreneur since 2012, and I started investing, investing in VC from 2014-15. Um, now we set up a, a multifamily office called the Plutus Investment Group that invests in venture capital on a deal-by-deal -deal basis. We invest six to eight investments a year from pre-seed to pre-IPO. And then um, we do a lot of uh, life science. So life science, biotech, medtech, it's uh, our forte. We have a board of directors who are very, 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 uh, very, very deep knowledge of this asset class. And uh, we're very excited about the future. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Uh, you already said a bit, uh, where where are the sectors properly that you like to invest and in stage and geography? Uh, I'll, I'll start by the last one. The geography is Europe and US. Uh, we're not comfortable with emerging markets. <clears throat> I personally don't like emerging market risk uh, because I'm not comfortable with the legal framework in these emerging markets. So we shy away from emerging markets. Uh, but we invest <clears throat> across, I would say, mostly Western Europe and um, and um, and the States. If we look at it, the way we're investing now, I would say 50% of what we do is in the UK, 25%, or let's say 40% UK, 30% States, and 30% Europe, continental Europe. And uh, how much do you normally invest? <clears throat> Interesting. Um, our ticket sizes can be from a couple of hundreds of thousands to a couple of million to like five million. Uh, with the smallest investments we did was 100,000. The largest was in dollars, $5 million. And we can invest more through a network. We have of partners, VC funds, larger family offices, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so that's where we, um, that's how we operate. You invest early. So which are the top concerns? Uh, where do you find the convention when investing? What do you look at the most? The company, the team, the product or service itself? Interesting. Uh, first, I look at the... Look, again, I've always said that in every, for a company to work, you have three components. You have the idea, i.e. the technology, the, 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 the idea. You have the team, and by the team, I mean the execution and uh, whether the team is able to execute. And the last one is the, the capital. So I've always believed that the idea and the capital are not as important as the team and as the founders. So first, of course, I have to like the idea, but I really need to make sure that these founders can execute on their business. And if they cannot execute on their business, then no. I mean, I had plenty of situations where I walked away from these at the last minute because we realized that we cannot work with these founders or there is something we cannot, something weird, something we don't understand, something that made us say, you know what, I don't think I can work with these guys. And then, thank you very much. How important is face-to-face? Do you meet founders in person or you can go all the way down to investing online? 
uh, <clears throat> I prefer to meet uh, face to face. Uh, to be honest, uh, I we have invested in companies online uh, by online uh, meetings. Um, that reminds me one of the investments we made in the US last year, this year, sorry. Uh, the team was in the US, etc. So we had to do the meetings online. But I don't mind. For me, it's whether face to face or online. I mean, I'm still a bit old school, so I still like to, to, to spend time with the founder. Also, it's very important because there is also a personal angle with these founders. You know, you need to, because you will, once you invest in these companies, you will go through a journey with the founder and, and, and you need to understand the person. You know, it's one, because we're here to help the founder grow his company. So for me to help him, and I want to make sure I need, I need to understand him. I need to understand what is his person, what, how is his personal life, what is his, uh, what are these, uh, what are his issues, what are, you know, I want to make sure also this person is not a drug addict, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> these, are, these are things that come when you see the person one, two, three times, you see him, and, 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 and you want to make sure that this is a stable person. This is an emotionally stable person. You know, like some people can be very unstable, very unpredictable, and uh, you cannot try a business like this. I agree. I can agree more. How often do you like to meet the founders before investing and after it done investments? Depends if we're taking a lead role, a lead investor role or not. <clears throat> if we're taking a lead investor role, Generally, in the beginning, we tend to meet the invest the, the founder or not, uh, because you know again we're running a business, our business like a family office, so we consider that the companies where we invest are part of the family. So generally, I like to meet him maybe once a week or once every two weeks, etc., because I believe that in this first step in the beginning, that's where they need us the most. Uh, that's when they need us the most. And therefore, uh, we want to make sure that we can provide them all the support, all the advice they need. I think uh, down, the, down the road, I mean, when the company starts growing, etc., I mean, we, didn't, we don't need to meet them like often. Maybe we can meet once a month, once a year. It depends. It depends. Like, I've invested in a company in 2016 that was valued at $10 million. Now it's valued at $200 million. And... I don't even meet the founder anymore. I talk to her on WhatsApp maybe once every three months or something. How do you? How much do you get involved with the with your companies, with your portfolio, and how do you add value to them? I mean, look, we try to get involved if they need us. The reason how we add value is because we are entrepreneurs ourselves. We set up businesses. We know. We know the shortcuts for the company to move quickly, be efficient, uh, optimize their costs, make sure they're dealing with the right venture parties. I mean, we've met with, like, just to give you an example, we have met with companies who have never even dealt, that have never de dealt with a shareholder agreement, doesn't even know what is a shareholder agreement, has never dealt with, doesn't know what's a subscription letter. Uh, and these are things that we need to uh, we need to help with. Of course. Do you prefer leading or following your, the investments? It depends. It depends. If it's early stage, I prefer leading. If it's um, anyway, we're not. We don't have very deep pockets, even though we can go to tickets up to five million. But um, we have been. I mean, we have done a lot of these where we're just a minority shareholder. And, and we're happy with that. If if we, but but one thing for sure is for every investment we do our own due diligence in a very institutional way. So we have a board who have different types of expertise, especially in the life science space. So we do our homework and we do like a proper due diligence before making any investments. But we have no problem with being like being a follow because anyway we. We, the due diligence we, we do is like about the technology and the team, etc. Do you have funders when they need following around? Do you give them your connections? Yes, we help them a lot. Uh, do you expect your portfolio uh, 
having some kind of interaction to some extent, working together? We try to do that. We try to build an ecosystem where the companies can help each other. Yes, we tried. We did it in the past with two of our companies. And actually, one of them became a client of the other. Uh, we try to do it also in the, in the... We have done that. And we try to do it if we can. Now we are building our main focus now. We're focusing on life, on life science, healthcare, biotech, medtech. On the other side, we're also focusing on logistics because we did some interesting transaction in logistics. Uh, we, we, we just incubated a logistics company and we're going to do another one i'm sure all these companies will interact with each other what's the point of view on pivoting should a founder pivot when things are not going well of course i think it's important to adapt because i i, I believe on the fact that when you start a, when you start a business you have an idea you have a certain projection you have a certain how how this business is going to be but it's never, it's, it never goes as expected. So you need, that's why it's important that the, the founder needs to be flexible, pivot. He can pivot, change the business plan, change the direction. I believe in the fact that if you put a group of very smart people, very motivated, hard workers, and very good entrepreneurs, they will make it work. Sometimes when you look at an idea, you say, no, this is not a good idea. I don't like the idea. Yeah? But, but down the road, it works. It works not because the idea is, re- is not, it, it works. It's not because the idea is revolutionary or it's a game changer or something. It's just because the entrepreneur is good enough that he executes it well. Indeed. And that he executes it well. And, and that's, that's very important. Again, I've always said, if you put like 100, 10 for, you give 10 for the, the, the idea, you give 10 for the capital because the access to capital is always there. The execution is 80. So the execution is, is, is eight times more important than the idea of the capital. I mean, we've seen some amazing ideas with amazing amounts of capital and they ended up being failures because the founder did not execute well. Indeed. Why do you become an investor? Ah, interesting. Uh, I became an investor because I, in my first company, I was a CEO. And um, I managed to get some liquidity. And I started investing. Also, I realized that I cannot be a good CEO. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, I realized I, I cannot be a good CEO. And I said, I'm not a good CEO. I don't have the, I'm not the person who, who can be a good CEO. I think I can I, I think I can I can be a good investor. I think I am a good investor. Uh, I just don't have the and the, what I like the most in what we do in this space because look, I invest in tech, I invest in life science, I invest in in digital transformation, I invest in web three, I invest in biotech, you know, in these industries, you all these new industries. I don't invest, I'm not doing like real estate or listed equities, listed bonds, et cetera. And what's why I'm doing that, investing in these industries, because the people you meet in these industries are fascinating. You see, like when we used to sit at the trading desk of a bank, it's Morgan Stanley or Goldman, your, your example or your example of success is a guy who's running a bigger trading desk or running a team, a larger team or running like a, a department at an investment bank. Now, I mean, people who fascinate me are scientists. You know, are people who have like, like crazy amounts of science behind them. I mean, you meet people who can be the next Nobel Prize. You meet people who have created a science that's like, it's just very, very impressive. And I find that very intellectually stimulating. I mean, I had situations where with the, some of these scientists with whom we wanted to invest in the companies, where they, they, they actually, I call the scientists and tell me, you know what, uh, professor, let's go and have dinner you and me. Because for me, I, I really like it to sit down with someone like this. And, you know, you, it's even enriching from a personal standpoint. Yeah. And, 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 and that's, that's for me, that's, that's much better than just working in the trading floor and you're just making money for the sake of making money. 
<laughs> this compatriot so I've been training myself as well. You're perfectly right. Which are the critical points that trigger your decision to invest? Let's say you had two similar companies. What's going to make the difference? Which are the okay. best fits for you, the team? Uh, do you invest in a very uh, big-headed team which is not going to listen to anyone except themselves? Exactly. I think the most important for founders is to accept advice and listen and to be humble. The problem with the, some founders, as soon as they raise the first one or two million, they just think they think they are Mark Zuckerberg and they stop listening. <laughs> and I had, I had a situation with the company and actually in, in, still in trouble. Um, I used to be on a board of a company where the founder never wanted to listen. And I used to tell the founder, so you don't listen, you have to listen. You know, you have to listen to your investor. We're here to help you. We're not here to screw you. And um, I think the most important is listening, humility, integrity, and the ability to adapt. The ability to be able to do new turn and do complete something completely different. What can be a good, let me say, even perfect, if there is any concept of perfection, to pitch you and convince you? What can be the perfect pitch? Mm, good question. <laughs> I think I need someone who can be aggressive, uh, who listens, and who thinks big. How founders should approach venture capitalists or angels? I think they have to have the idea clear because look, it depends how sophisticated is the angel investor and the, or the, the, the venture capitalist. I think again, sometimes what I see, like for example, when I, I'm pitched by some life science biotech companies, the, 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 the founders tend to go a lot in details with the science, et cetera. I'm not a scientist, but I think it's a question of just uh, doing things in a very, explaining things simplistically. Very simple. Explaining it very simple. What about intellectual property? Do you mind they have, IP has to belong to the startup? For example, in your case, you do life science, for example, which is pretty much extremely intensive when it comes to uh, to IP. Do do you matter? Is matters for you a lot that belongs to the startup? Of course, it has to belong to the company for sure. I mean, we're not gonna invest in a company where it's the founder who keeps the IP. No, never. Where do you see the most promising sectors in the coming here where to start a, a venture? A money will go. Hmm. Interesting. I. I still see a lot. I mean, look, life science and biotech is something that is very fascinating for me because we all want to, we are in, in a world where we all want to live longer and we will live longer and healthier. So, and, and we will start seeing some diseases because people, some more diseases because people will live longer. If you look at something like Parkinson's or Alzheimer, uh, we you see we see a lot of people getting uh, catching Parkinson's and Alzheimer because people live longer. Like 100 years from now, people used to live maybe less than 60 years, and now people because they live 80, 90, 100, they're more likely and more vulnerable to 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 develop Alzheimer, Parkinson's, etc. So I think this space of neurological degenerative diseases, and again, it's not only Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, uh, I mean, we can talk also about uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, ALS, etc. These are diseases where there has not been so much progress from a scientific standpoint. People still die from these diseases. So I see a lot of progress here. There are some amazing things that some companies are doing. We are looking and we invested in some companies doing that. Um, I also see, I'm very curious about what will happen in Web3, especially the metaverse, et cetera. 
um, I am, let's put it this way, I am cautiously curious. Uh, uh, sometimes in my mind, I see this is the next internet. This is the revolu next revolution. The other question is, is it useful? Is it going to bring value to us? Uh, like, uh, is it is it make sense to have a, like an avatar, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Is it important? Not really. And it's funny because if you compare to Facebook in uh, in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, I was very skeptical about Facebook. Yeah. I, I, like, what is this? You know, you do, and, and everyone was talking about Facebook. And what is this? I mean, you just have to go and chat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the day, I think I was right because Facebook now, the business is going south. At the end of the day, you have to look at things that really bring value to humanity. And basically things that we really need. Do I need to have an avatar in the metaverse? No. <laughs> For now, but again, what, what I learned is technology is, is technology is, is moving very fast and is driving us with 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 with, the, with its progress. If you look now, I'm talking to you from my iPhone. So 20 years down the road, 20 or 30 years ago, I would have never imagined having an iPhone and having like the utility of an iPhone. But now I find it very important. I cannot survive without it. So maybe in 20, 10, 20 years, we will not survive without the metaverse. So it's 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 a bit complex. That's why. That's why at least when we focus on life science, med tech, biotech, we know that we are helping people to be healthy. Oh, and yeah. this, this, this is something that is not dependent on the technology. It's dependent on human being. Absolutely. Yeah. Mohamed, thank you so much for coming to the Investor Talk. It has been okay. a very good pleasure for me. Yeah, I like it. I like it. It was very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>